Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Schiff. Uh, I'm a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in uh, Denver, uh, Colorado. Uh, today, I will be presenting uh, highlights uh, from a uh, poster from ULAR uh, 2013 that we presented uh, entitled Abitacep and Anti-TNF Monoclonal Antibodies, Efficacy and Safety Comparisons. The first question really comes up is, why is this so important? And I think it is very important. We know that uh, the uh, comparative effectiveness trials are really the wave of the future. We know uh, that uh, the uh, federal government has put in uh, over $1 billion uh, into uh, research money that we can apply for to do uh, comparative effectiveness uh, trials. This was not uh, done through uh, federal uh, money, however. Uh, the uh, other thing is that the world now is doing uh, and beginning to do uh, trials that are looking at uh, the comparative effectiveness of agents in rheumatoid arthritis. Well, why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because our randomized controlled trials, which are usually done against the placebo, have shown us that we now have and have registered both in the United States through the FDA and Europe through the EMA, or European Medical uh, Authority, uh, now many new therapies for rheumatoid arthritis. We know as clinicians uh, that we have many uh, new therapies that, that we can choose for our patients. Uh, our patients know this as well because there's a lot of direct to the consumer advertising and they often come to us uh, asking about some of these agents. And the real question now is not whether or not an agent is better than placebo, but what agent can we choose for our patients uh, in the office or clinic that would be the best choice for those patients? And that's why now comparative effectiveness trials are being looked at uh, with uh, such an uh, important light. In the past, uh, we've done this uh, through uh, databases. Uh, not that databases still can't give us answers. However, uh, very interestingly, I was uh, taken by two presentations at uh, ULAR, uh, which uh, showed us that uh, two databases, one was the National Data Bank, which is a very well-known U.S. Uh, database, and the other was the uh, very well-known, uh, very complete uh, data bank in Sweden, uh, that uh, patients who were chosen actually for abitacep uh, were uh, chosen because they had higher morbidity uh, and uh, other problems uh, associated with medical diseases. So that really gave a bias. The other thing is we used to use and still do use what's called an indirect treatment comparison technique. This is the Cochrane Report. All of us rheumatologists have read the Cochrane Report, which compares biologic agents, but it has to use the randomized controlled trials, comparing it to placebo, using a lot of indirect comparisons. That's why head-to-head -head trials are really the wave of the future, and that's why uh, I think uh, the head-to-head uh, -head trial with the two-year data for AMPL was accepted as a uh, podium presentation and was very, very uh, well received by uh, both the uh, scientific community and the press. And also this uh, poster looking not just at the AMPL trial, but also looking at a previous trial called the ATTEST trial, which is a head-to-head uh, -head comparison of uh, abitacep uh, to infliximab, again on the standard of care of methotrexate. So what did this uh, poster do and why did we do this poster? Well, we don't have a pure, well-powered head-to-head trial uh, except for the AMPLE trial. The ATTEST trial was not powered to be a head-to-head -head trial. It was powered against placebo, and there were three arms in that trial. Uh, the arms were placebo, uh, were methotrexate uh, plus placebo, or methotrexate plus infliximab, or methotrexate uh, plus uh, abitacep. And again, uh, this was done a number of years ago when we only had IV uh, abitacep. And that trial, uh, despite not being powered for it, did show that when one looked at infliximab plus methotrexate, the anti-TNF agent, infliximab, or looked at the uh, abitacep, again, IV plus methotrexate, that there was an equal uh, response uh, in both of those uh, agents. 
and the safety uh, appeared uh, to be slightly better in the uh, group that got the uh, abatacept with more bacterial infections and serious adverse events and serious infectious events in the, uh, the test trial in the abatacept arm. And again, uh, two cases of tuberculosis in the infliximab or anti-TNF arm. So we uh, used uh, the uh, data set from Ample, which was using subcutaneous abatacept, uh, compared to alimumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, and then we used the data from the ATTEST trial that I just described, uh, which uh, looked at the uh, infliximab as the anti-TNF agent versus uh, abatacept, again on the standard of care uh, methotrexate. And what we found, uh, I think, was quite interesting uh, when we looked. The depth of response or the amount of response, whether it was measured by ACR 205070 or DAS score, no matter how you measure the response, the response was uh, equal in both the AMPLE trial as it was uh, in the uh, test trial. Uh, the uh, important uh, piece of information there, again, is it gave us choices. Uh, the other uh, important uh, information was that the patients who were uh, in the AMPLE trial actually had better responses for what's called low disease activity and remission. That's what the uh, target is that we usually shoot for in rheumatoid arthritis. Well, we went back and looked, and why did the patients in AMPLE, which was subcutaneous abatacept or alimumab on background methotrexate, why did they have better responses uh, than the patients in the infliximab group for this endpoint, which is low disease activity or remission? And the answer was pretty simple. The answer was they had shorter disease duration. And we have known for years that patients who have shorter disease duration really are the patients who do the best. And if we wait for patients to have chronic, long-standing, active rheumatoid arthritis, they don't do quite as well. However, what we did show was that both groups, whether they had short disease duration as an ample or longer disease duration as they have in uh, the ATTEST trial, they really responded about the same. But again, the conclusion should be that, again, treating our patients earlier and more aggressively if they're methotrexate incomplete responders uh, should be done. We also looked at the safety issues. And again, as I mentioned, the uh, safety issues from both AMPLE and from uh, the ATTEST trial fit with what was known about uh, these two agents, uh, namely the, the abatacept plus methotrexate primarily had uh, serious uh, adverse events and serious infections that were uh, bacterial, such as pneumonias and patients uh, who uh, had, or cellulitis, and patients who were treated with an anti-TNF agent had a higher risk of tuberculosis, again with two cases in AMPLE and two cases in the ATTEST trial on infliximab. So at the end of the day, I think what we can conclude are a number of things. One is that uh, we have uh, agents uh, that are very effective for rheumatoid arthritis. Again, not necessarily shown here, but shown through the randomized controlled trials. And that includes uh, the monoclonal antibodies, which are abitaz I'm sorry, which are adalimumab and infliximab. And now we have the T-cell uh, modulator, which is uh, abitacept. And on standard of care methotrexate, these agents seem to perform well. They perform better, and we can do better for our patients if we intervene earlier in the course of their disease uh, for uh, adding a biologic agent if they have a methotrexate incomplete response. Uh, one other difference, uh, and we couldn't compare this, was radiologic differences. We had x-rays in the AMPLE trial which showed that uh, both uh, subcutaneous abatacept plus methotrexate or adalimumab plus methotrexate really inhibited the uh, uh, radiologic progression, 85% uh, with no radiologic progression, but we had no x-rays done in the ATTEST trial, and again, uh, x-rays in a long-standing RA population usually uh, don't show us a lot because of uh, the uh, need for very, very large numbers. So again, I think that uh, at the end of the day, uh, this gives clinicians a choice, and it gives them a choice between uh, either a T-cell modulator, as I said, abatacept or a uh, anti-TNF agent for uh, efficacy with some differences in safety.
So at ULAR uh, 2013, uh, this poster uh, had a lot of uh, people coming by uh, and uh, obviously looking at the data and a lot of people uh, asking uh, a number of uh, questions. Uh, again, uh, a lot of the questions uh, came up uh, were, which were specific for the two studies that we chose to put into uh, the trial, why we chose those two studies, and uh, was it completely uh, appropriate to choose uh, to these uh, trials, and could there be differences? So the first question came up is that the AMPLE study, uh, which is uh, subcutaneous abatacept, and again, subcutaneous abatacept, uh, plus methotrexate versus adalimumab plus methotrexate, it was done with, sub again, obviously subcutaneous abatacept. And the ATTEST trial was done with IV uh, abatacept, and can we really be comparing these two trials? So I think there's very good information in the literature. And actually, uh, uh, Dr. Mark Genovese from Stanford uh, Medical School has presented and published uh, an article with a very large data set comparing, again, head-to-head -head subcutaneous abatacept to IV abatacept, showing that those two agents are really equivalent. So it didn't matter if you gave subcutaneous abatacept uh, with uh, methotrexate or IV uh, abatacept with methotrexate, uh, there was really no difference in a very large uh, data set uh, published uh, by uh, Dr. Genovese. Uh, so again, I think that uh, tells us we could uh, be looking at a subcutaneous population of abatacept patients or an IV population. And that was a big uh, issue and a big question. Uh, the other question came up is uh, in the ATTEST trial, uh, we used a dose of 3 milligrams per kilogram of infliximab, and people thought maybe that was too low a dose uh, to be a comparator dose. However, uh, when we did the trial, and the trial for a test was done a number of years ago, the uh, worldwide approved dose of uh, infliximab plus methotrexate was 3 milligrams per kilogram, and it was done every eight weeks. Uh, and again, whenever you do a trial, you have to use the approved doses because if you use a non-approved dose, you're really doing two trials. Um, and again, uh, the answer is that we can compare the 3 milligrams per kilogram of infliximab both for efficacy and for safety. And again, we know safety issues as we increase the dose of infliximab can be increased. So again, the differences in safety for a test, uh, uh, I think, uh, really would be uh, even more pronounced. So again, that was one of the uh, concerns. Uh, the other concern was obviously the disease duration, uh, that one patient uh, group had a disease duration of less than two years, and the other had a disease duration that was longstanding, uh, that was uh, nine years or more. Um, and again, uh, we uh, addressed that in the poster, and we spoke to this issue, and essentially, at the end of the day, we were able to show that it is best for us to treat our patients early. It is best to intervene with patients who have active disease early to get low disease activity or remission, which are the targets, uh, and the ULAR guidelines, which were revised and presented at uh, the 2013 ULAR meeting, speak again to the fact that we do need to shoot for this target, and the target is either low disease activity or remission. But again, if we have longstanding disease, it tells us that we have a choice as well uh, between an anti-TNF agent here in Fliximab or a, a T-cell modulator such as uh, abatacept. Other questions uh, included the fact that, much like the questions we got from uh, the uh, podium for the uh, AMPLE trial that was presented at ULAR, was, well, if these are equivalent, uh, how do I choose one over the other? And I think, again, this uh, really needs to be addressed in clinic with the individual patient who has comorbid diseases, and has preferences, again, maybe for an IV preparation or subcutaneous preparation, although abatacept now is available uh, in both of those routes. So again, that decision really allows the clinician uh, data to have the quality of, uh, or at least comparability of uh, efficacy and uh, maybe some small safety differences uh, that need to be considered when choosing a uh, biologic agent in a patient who's having an incomplete response uh, to methotrexate. And again, uh, the uh, other question came up is in the ATTEST trial, we did have a placebo arm, which we did not have in the ample arm. 
And the question is, uh, did we need a uh, placebo arm in AMPL? And the answer really is no. And the uh, FDA has a white paper and a guideline that says if you are comparing two active and very active agents, uh, you really, again, ethically should not need or shouldn't use a placebo. And that's why we chose not to have a placebo. And we know that the response rates for ACR20 uh, plus methotrexate for adalimumab and for abatacept are two-thirds of our patients, so no placebo was done. A placebo was used uh, in the other uh, trial, the ATTEST trial, and again, it was uh, used, um, again, to look at safety issues because it was done for regulatory purposes. So uh, these placebo patients at six months uh, were uh, given the option of going on to abatacept, and that was really, in a sense, a way of allowing them to have active therapy uh, if they were in the placebo arm, but they were not analyzed uh, in uh, either of these arms. But we did go back and take a look, and uh, after six months of abatacept, and we have two years of data now on a test uh, that uh, these patients caught up to, uh, let's say, their brethren who were on uh, subcutaneous uh, abatacept, and they caught up uh, pretty much uh, relatively uh, quickly, and at the same onset of action and the same kinetics of action as if they had started uh, six months prior to that. So again, uh, starting abatacept here appeared to be appropriate. Another important question was, uh, given the uh, remission rates, uh, is it important, again, uh, this came up at least four or five times, to uh, intervene early. But I think we as rheumatologists know early diagnosis, early intervention in rheumatoid arthritis is important. We've been trying to teach this to our primary care uh, and internal medicine brethren to uh, hopefully refer us patients with rheumatoid arthritis so we can make the diagnosis early and then uh, intervene. And generally, we intervene initially with methotrexate, and if they don't respond or the methotrexate are incomplete responders, then we add a biologic agent. And I think the AMPL trial I and mean, the TEST trial uh, and this paper uh, and this poster from ULAR give us information as clinicians as what to do or choices of what to do for a patient that's sitting in front of us. Then the question came up, was there a, a difference uh, giving patients either IV abatacept in the test trial every four weeks or giving them uh, every eight-week infliximab? Well, actually, we couldn't tell if that was a problem because the patients got an IV every four weeks. Uh, if they were on infliximab, they got infliximab every eight weeks, but at the four-week interval, they got a placebo infusion. So again, everybody got a four-week infusion. Uh, and that uh, cannot really be determined uh, from the test trial. And that's uh, something, uh, obviously, the uh, physicians uh, need to consider. Uh, but again, I think uh, most patients would prefer to come uh, less often to the doctor's office or the infusion suite uh, than more often. However, now we have subcutaneous available uh, biologic agents, uh, such as subcutaneous now abatacept, we have subcutaneous uh, galimumab, lycanfliximab. We have subcutaneous, obviously, adalimumab as choices, and then they don't have to come at all to the IV infusion unit. And then the last question uh, was uh, really, again, relating uh, to the route of administration and also whether or not you needed to what's called load your patients with uh, IV uh, abatacept. So we presented at ACR, uh, actually, uh, just before the ULAR, meet, ULAR meeting, so it's ACR 2012, looking at whether or not you needed to load or not load your patients with an IV load of uh, abatacept before starting subcutaneous uh, abatacept. And it appears not to make any difference at all, even though the label, and this is now off-label, says you should try and do it unless there's a reason not to. But most rheumatologists in the U.S. are not giving an IV load. There doesn't appear to be scientific evidence that this is uh, needed. Uh, and again, AMPL was done without an IV load, uh, but I don't think that that was a uh, fault of the study. So at the end of the day, I think uh, we have more information to help us as clinicians and help our patients uh, and give them choices between a monoclonal antibody, whether it be adalimumab in the AMPL trial or infliximab in the, uh, the test trial versus uh, abatacept with subcutaneous abatacept and ample and in IV abatacept uh, given in the test trial. Thank you very much.